final full session uh, here at the symposium. Um, I just wanted to tell you that so far we've had uh, well over a thousand uh, digital views for all of our content, so that's people actually tuning in and watching um, the uh, you know, live stream pre-record, a number that we expect to, to grow, so we are now officially in the minority, those of us who are here, <laughs> which we're kind of quite proud of. Um, this session is uh, just to let you know how we arrived at these sessions, so the, you know, the topics that we're discussing. We put out a call um, back end of last year saying, what do people want to talk about? And we had over 120 responses, different topic ideas. So we narrowed those down to kind of five or six per session, and then we did a Twitter voting poll. And this is the topic that won the future session. Does new technology enable or create more barriers? Is technology reducing the uniqueness of disabled artists or enhancing it? What exists already? Who has access to it? And how can more disabled artists get what they want and need? What will the arts and access look like in the future? And your chair for this session, I'm delighted to say, is Claire Reddington. Claire joined Watershed back in uh, 2004, establishing its creative technology programs, including the amazing Pervasive Media Studio and the Playable City program. Uh, she became creative director in 2014, and we're so incredibly proud that she is now the CEO of Watershed, as of a couple of weeks back. Over to Claire. Hi. Um, yeah, I'm Claire. Um, I'm an average height white woman. I'm wearing what Rachel Caldicott would refer to as an art smock. Um, I have sort of mesh uh, sequin leggings and a blunt fringe. And um, we're going to talk today a little bit about technology in the present and technology in the future and how those two things might interact. And to start off with, I guess I feel funny about technology. I love the conversations that technology enables and the places it allows me to go. I like the shape and the feel of the old internet, which erased structure and did away with hierarchy. But like you, I'm guessing my inbox is full, my social media stream is full of Nazis, and I'm overwhelmed. <laughs> <laughs> the <co> <laughs> you want to stop following them? <laughs> 
<laughs> the echo chamber, James, the echo chamber. <laughs> the culture sector feels a bit weird about technology too. The culture sector queues at the door of the pervasive media studio asking us to digital stuff for them. <laughs> For 10 years, we have not digital stuff for anyone, but people still ask. The culture sector wants innovation, but they want it to look exactly like the thing they have already, and that's usually a brochure, which is a website. <laughs> Funders and policymakers are a little bit funny about technology. They ask us to write separate policies for our funding applications. And I won't co-opt the great friend of mine who referred to that as absurd as having an electricity policy. They want us to write digital policies, but they don't themselves understand the difference between a stream and a download. The funders are funny about technology because they court the large technology providers without asking questions and they don't understand the leadership role of artists and the cards that they have in their pants that they have in their hands to play. <laughs> the world is pretty funny about technology. Right now we know we can't trust it. We know that it's riddled with unconscious bias. Technology is made by the same old white man. Um, Tech Nation, which is the UK's kind of demographic understanding of, its, of the technology workforce, doesn't even collect data on disability. We don't even know how bad the problem is of representation in the, with the people who make our technology. So really, there's nothing funny about technology, apart from cat gifts and Slack and, and Beat Saber and activism and the, all the things that technology enables and asks questions of. Technology gives us a way to make and share work and especially here, I should say the people in our community that are asking the most delicious and most dangerous questions are the deaf and disabled artists we're collaborating with. I'm looking at Aidan, at Jane, at Johnny, at Juliet and Raquel asking interesting and difficult questions of the technology that we make and share things with. So today, I hope we're going to ask and share some more of those difficult questions. We're going to unpack technology from all angles, look at its competing tensions, and have a think about what it means for the future of the culture sector. I've got a fucking great panel. They are incredibly knowledgeable in this area, and so I'm really excited to share them with you. So I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves and to spend 10 minutes kind of sharing some thoughts with you and then we'll have a discussion. So to start with, Kamal Sinclair, director of the Sundance Institute's New Frontiers Lab, who is here for one day <laughs> from America. <laughs> You're up. First time in London. <laughs> Am I up? I'm up? I'm up. Okay. All right. So... Um, I'm just going to do this so I can do my cheat sheet on my slides, Claire Reddington, amazing. Um, so I have been working with artists um, at the intersection of art, technology, and science for the last seven years um, at the Sundance Institute, and we've supported 1,500 artists that are doing this brave kind of work. Um, we're looking for artists that are not just following the trends of technology and the kind of novelty of it and the, the gimmicks or the whiz bang of it all. Oh, hey, my name is Kamal Sinclair. Let me tell you what I look like. <laughs> I forgot that stuff. Um, I am uh, five foot 10, which I think is like 1.78 uh, meters. I am, I've got really curly hair that goes a little bit past my shoulders. I am a woman of, um, interracial background. My father is African American. My mother is Irish Scottish American, um, and I. So I have kind of this like high yellow skin is what they call it, <laughs> where I came from, um, and I am wearing gray pants and a black sweater and a black top and uh, and, a, and a smile because <laughs> I'm happy to be here. I'm a little delirious with jet lag, but I am very happy to be here. Something oh, strange no. is inside, and that's going to be really Annoying. distracting to people. Okay. And there's some sound, someone who knows what they're doing, maybe let's leave it like that. Is that better? Can you guys hear me? Hello? Testing? Okay. All right. I think it was my hair. I'll just keep it on this side. <laughs> um, and so, what I was saying is that my role at Sundance has been to basically create community for artists, technologists, 
people from the sciences to come together and to find, not just to invent um, new ways of telling story, but to find the meaning and the reason to do that, um, to find something resonant, uh, something that makes meaning in the world. Um, so I've had the privilege of working with an incredible, brave group of, of artists over those seven years. But in that time, I also got to have a front row seat to explosions in um, kind of the tech trends of the time, particularly virtual reality, where we showcased the first prototype of the Oculus Rift back in 2012. We've seen all these things, kind of um, augmented reality, artificial intelligence, even biomedia, um, be kind of the arenas that artists are, are asking really hard questions and interrogating. Um, and I've seen, definitely seen up close where those power structures that have, um, that from you know, traditional media, traditional mass <coughs> media, um, have started to replicate themselves in these new emerging mediums. And that was a concern of mine, especially being somebody from a number of you know, identity backgrounds that would be categorized as marginalized in the tech and the media world. Um, I started to ask hard questions about how do we try to stop those um, propensities in their tracks at the beginning of something so that we don't have to, I remember I was on a conversation with a funder at this time when I was like expressing my frustration with seeing some of the power dynamics replicate themselves. Um, and, and they said, well, we see that pipeline technologies, I mean, pipeline issues take about 15 years to correct. And I said, how is that possible with a medium that's two years old? And I said, how is it possible when people from very intersectional backgrounds were actually at the dawn of this, but they're not the ones that are getting funded to actually continue to innovate this. I said that, that old thinking about how do we create inclusion does not work in this, in this, and it probably never worked before either, otherwise we would have achieved it. So trying to question those things. So that funder gave me money <laughs> and said, hey, go out there and um, ask a lot of people these questions and help bring back some ideas about how we can intervene at the dawn of some of these new mediums that artists and storytellers are, are, are creating work in. So that resulted in a project called Making a New Reality um, that the Ford Foundation commissioned. And I asked over 100 people in the field from all different kinds of backgrounds um, three questions. I said, what is emerging media? So I can get a scope around it. Uh, what are your concerns when it comes to equality, inclusion, equity, justice? And for every concern you give me, please give me a recommendation for how we can mitigate that concern now. And so that resulted in a 180 page paper and a series um, on, uh, that I've been publishing on makingandnewreality.org over the last you know, year or so. So I'm gonna just not talk a whole lot about it, but I wanna give you a little bit of the overview so we can, as we dive into this conversation with the panel, you get understanding. The way that we, our curatorial lens at Sundance is that we're following the artists. We're not prescribing anything to the artists about technology and what they should be doing. We follow the artists into their exploration of how they want to creatively express in these new technologies. Um, we understand that story doesn't exist unless it's been heard or communicated in some way. So we are looking at artists that are hacking into and inventing the communication architecture and how humans connect and, and share those ideas and stories. Um, we also understand that when we say making a new reality, we're not just being poetic, that we understand that storytellers have the power of manifestation, that storytellers define our cultural uh, norms, storytellers um, define identity, storytellers disrupt identity, storytellers um, create culture. And so we've seen things like this uh, make, you know, minority report is always you know, an example that's brought up. Well, the guy that was the art director on that is actually one of our artists and advisors in our labs. And out of a process, he did a collective design process with people across all these different sectors of um, technology, engineering, science, arts, and they came up with this vision of the future back 25 years ago or so. And out of this collective design process, 100 patents came, 100 new technologies emerged from an imagination process. So that's how powerful we are as artists. 
the, the things that, the stories we tell, the imagination that we make actually does result in what comes into being. Obviously, this is talking about a technological manifestation of imagination. We understand that, that as storytellers, that what we put, that representations we put out into the world, the stories, the narratives about who we are and what is possible actually changes the ways in which human beings can even perceive what they can bring into, into the future. Um, so I, I won't get into a lot of the details, but the artists that we're working with are, not, are definitely doing very brave interrogation of things like artificial intelligence, um, holographic uh, you know, making of, like in this case, this is a holographic image of a Holocaust survivor that they have um, put a natural language processing uh, system with so that you can walk up to the hologram and ask him questions and have a natural conversation with him. And this is where artists are trying to understand what is the future of documentary, what's the future of history making, what's the future of memoir, what's the future of your relationship with your ancestors. So, you know, this is artificial intelligence, this hologram. This is a similar process where an artist is trying to understand how social AI, become, how do we interrogate, how do we understand you know, smart machines that are developing identities uh, as entities, right? So these are really tough areas. We're working with artists that are dealing with um, technologies that are either being embedded in our bodies or becoming part of your, you know, and which I think this is an area that the disabled community has deep and intrinsic understanding and as artists kind of start to it shed the light in your interrogation of these technologies, your use of these technologies, assistive technologies. What does that mean when we are now embedding those technologies in our bodies in integrated ways? What does it mean when we start, when artists are now looking at bioengineering and the ways in which you know, these questions, they ask all new kinds of questions around what does it mean for the future of humanity, right? Um, and we're also looking at artists that are at the intersection of medical science and technology. So this is a piece that we showcased in 20, 17 about a group of scientists that are working with paraplegics using exoskeletons, virtual reality, and brain wave input technology um, for therapy and have actually seen pretty impressive results. What does this mean about how we're hacking into our bodies through these technologies, especially when it's connected to story? So I won't go into much more because I think my time is up. I'm almost up. Uh, you've got three minutes. You've got three minutes. So, so I just wanted to show a little bit, like this is a piece where an artist went around New York City and gathered um, fingernails, hair, uh, cigarette butts, and then was able to use the FBI DNA profiling system to 3D print the strangers' faces. Um, <laughs> so, you know, um, so what does this mean when, what, what does this mean when now we can embed on our DNA actual media? We can actually embed films and email servers on DNA strands. What does this mean when Caltech um, last month was able to create the first neural network, which is you know, kind of one of the foundations of machine learning, but now not on machines. They put the first neural network on DNA. The DNA is smart organic material that can read handwritten numbers. So these are questions, this is, this is such fundamental things about what does it mean for the future of humanity. And, and a lot of our, our um, partners in the field out there from the World Economic Forum and from these other places that are thinking about it through the lens of economics and business and commerce, like R Rachel said earlier, are missing some of the fundamental things about what's the future of culture. Just because we can do these things, what does that mean in terms of why are we doing these things? Who do we want to be in that future and how do we define it? And that is why it is essential for the people that are in this room to be part of that conversation in defining the future of, of society. So what were some of the concerns? There are a lot, and I'll go into this in more detail. Oh, I'm not getting it forward here. Ah, oh, I've lost my forwarding capability. Oh, there we go. So I asked a lot of things. We'll go into this in deep detail in the breakout session, what the concerns and what the interventions were. But, hello, I'm not getting well, my- technology. Yeah, you know, I'm talking about <laughs> DNA neural networks. <laughs> I'll get a <laughs> This is a quote that is specifically talking about racial injustice, but I think it, it talks about, I think it, it applies to all of the areas that we see injustice perpetuating in terms of the power structures and media and film, uh, and media and um, technology. The progress of racial justice and the development of technologies are not linear. Every time you develop a new technology, you need to have a thought process about the history and systems of oppression that the technology is being created and released into. 
Think about ways to bend the technology to justice and not allow it to replicate, entrench, and worsen injustice. And I think that's kind of in the DNA of artists um, asking these questions. And I'm looking forward to the conversation about how this community is contributing and continues to interrogate these, these, the future of culture. So thank you very much. Is, is everyone okay with the microphones now we've done a bit of hasty? Is it all, everyone can hear okay? <coughs> Great, okay, Johnny, you're up okay, next. Okay, take it, you got to do it there. Don't, don't do okay, it. fine, brilliantly. So um, I, I asked Johnny how he would like to be described because I'd written theatre maker down and he was like, oh, I don't know about that. Um, <laughs> I'm a man of many hats. Um, and so Johnny, a man of many hats, who's wearing none of them oh God, yeah, currently. Yeah, um, <laughs> is going to share how he came to technology and, and a bit about his practice. Okay, thank you, Claire. First of all, thank you very much for asking me to be here, the massive privilege. Um, great conversation, great talking. I was stumped last night thinking, thinking, thinking about it. And actually, I need to be thinking about my talk. So um, I had, uh, I'm really grateful for this uh, lovely pink uh, book that I'm able to write my notes in there. Um, I tried myself at... Um, uh, a white British man, uh, about five foot ten. I am forty-five. I have a uh, shaven head, um, uh, a beard, um, that um, grey head in my beard, which showed my age. Um, so I'm about forty-four. Um, I'm wearing uh, a blue shirt uh, and jeans. I think I'm quite smart today, because I think my mum is watching it on YouTube, <laughs> so I'm um, making an effort. Hi, ma'am. Um, <laughs> I have glasses on, and uh, I wear two uh, forty hearing aids. Um, so, if you do hear some kind of beepy noise, don't worry, it's not the fire alarm. It's probably uh, my hearing aid. Um, I describe myself um, a deaf man who uh, speaks very well. Uh, I was born deaf. I'm profoundly deaf. Um, deaf would not really. Um, a word when I grew up. Um, I kind of felt like uh, I would almost normalize in the way that um, I had to speak. So I've had that kind of intensive speech therapy. And it goes with a lot of deaf people, I suppose, um, back in the 70s, the 80s, where speech therapy was an option and not sign language. So I didn't really know sign language. In fact, I didn't even meet uh, a deaf person until about when I was about, uh, God, about 35 to about 10 years ago. So I kind of grew up in that kind of um, hearing world. Um, I was a teacher. I was a teacher for a long time. Um, I taught art and photography and uh, teaching in secondary level. But uh, I decided to quit teaching to uh, become um, a, an ACTAP consultant. Um, and the reason why I did that, because the lack of response to um, deaf artists in the US. Um, I felt that um, there's a lack of representation for deaf artists, not, not just on the stage, but uh, more about how uh, we make work accessible for deaf artists. Um, I um, had wor I worked with small companies all the way to uh, larger art venues. Um, I was very fortunate from Art Council Wales to give me uh, to support me in developing um, uh, a toolkit for deaf audience. Um, I continue to do this, but sometimes I question myself, is it working? Is it really working? Is that toolkit, I, it was a great toolkit, I worked on it for a long time, is it shelf or are people using it? Is my consultancy working? Is it going out there and coming out that ear? So I thought, and I apologise what I'm going to say, fuck it, I am going to become a performer. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to perform. I've never ever performed before. I've never um, acted before, I'm not trained, uh, but what I did know that um, I think by becoming a performer, I was hoping that I would, I would make a difference. I knew that becoming a teacher, I've had some experience working with um, people, so I thought, well, actually, um, I see the audience at my pupil. So, um, um, <coughs> we'll go on to the next slide. 
So um, I, um, you see on this slide is a, a poster, uh, the, and uh, the title of my uh, show is called uh, Loud is Not Always Clearer. And I came up with that title because people were shouting at me, and I would say pardon, they were shouting at me, and uh, so I wanted to make a bold statement. I am um, half naked on a chair, and um, I have uh, gaffer tape all around me. Please do not try this at home. Gaffer tape can really hurt when you take it off. Um, the reason why um, I wanted to have uh, gaffer tape around me, I wanted the idea of feeling trapped. Um, so, um, and that object uh, on my body, so I've got, um, um, like a, I don't know what it is, it's like a, an old hair laid maybe, or, or, or um, something. So, um, because um, I used to wear the big hearing aid, and uh, it was just my statement of what it was like to, f to be feeling quite trapped. Um, and uh, loud but not always clearer, it really is um, an autobiographical journey of uh, a deaf man uh, trapped in a hearing world. Um, and um, it really is uh, um, um, a, a struggle and uh, it talks about isolation in the hearing world. It's a story from my search for adapting and uh, it's a story of um, late introduction into uh, deaf culture. Um, before I play a video, I've got a video um, of my show. Um, I, 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 I make work that um, really is um, to an audience that for those who don't really know me and they need to really feel or care or um, something about me to feel empathy. And um, I used um, quite a lot of technology um, in making the show. Um, I, when I make work or when I develop work, um, I always, I parallel everything with make work. So at that, um, the script, um, the stage, the the stack design, and um, so for me, if I parallel everything uh, together, it made um, it made uh, more unique, adding more beautiful layer to the work. Um, I wanted to uh, give a, a personal show. I wanted to give a personal insight about Johnny um, through experience, isolation, frustration, vulnerability. I wanted the audience to sort of feel fall in love with me, regardless of my definite. Um, I think uh, developing this, I think ACTEC could enhance and support and not support. I think uh, the aesthetic of ACTEC could add fantastic layers. Um, in the film you're about to see, um, you will see me doing some rehearsing, uh, performing. Um, there will be there, there was a, a conversation with uh, two people looking away from the camera, talking. Um, th there are some, so the caption will be a bit distorted. And also at the very end, there will be me talking into uh, a megaphone. Um, can you uh, play the video? My name is Johnny. I was born deaf. Being raised in a hearing world, I had to learn the literally. I'm performing in a one-man show that explores my struggle of being a deaf man living in a hearing world. For a hearing audience, it's an eye-opening experience. For a deaf audience, it's a familiar tale of isolation. I was really fortunate to uh, have support from Natural Theatre Wales um, who, who, who spurred me on the idea of coming up with the show and um, then uh, future, future uh, funding from Outcome to Wales to really push me. Uh, the show, um, 
I didn't think, I didn't expect anything out of it, but it's been really positive um, in the way that uh, him and people had become up to me and said, I'm really sorry if I'm one of them, and uh, that people come up to me and say, thank you very much for being brave. And you know what, I'm sharing my story at the same for many deaf people. Um, the, the show went on tour uh, across Wales, sold out tours across Wales, and um, it's looking now to go to future, um, a future tour next year. Um, but I still, didn't, I still felt that I needed to do more. And um, could we go to the next slide? Um, I want to do more. I really wanted to... Um, empathy was something that was really important to me and uh, something that I really wanted the audience to really understand what I was feeling like. So I was very fortunate to um, get... Um, um, a, a, to be an artist of entity with Pervaded Media Studio um, at Bristol in the, water, in the watershed. And um, I like to to them, um, what can I do to uh, make the show better? They said, you don't need to do anything. It's it, it just how it is. So, um, so, so what I thought was uh, to come up with the idea, do I flip it? So the audience become deaf. So I invented, I come up with a, a concept, uh, and I called it HHA, Hearing, Hearing Aid. So um, the idea is that um, the audience will wear a hearing aid. Uh, it's a prototype, uh, we haven't, haven't been done yet, so it will be a 3D print. And the idea is that they're using technology to really give that kind of feeling of what it's like to wear a hearing aid and what it's like to hear those sounds. But bear in mind, I only hear 30% of um, a conversation. I rely on eye contact, I rely on body language, I rely on lip reading. I also have a lot of amplification of sounds. So I really wanted to get that to, um, uh, through the HHA. So how can we make that into a theatre space and really um, experience that? So um, what we have here, I don't know if you could play that gift. Um, what we have here, we have uh, something called fake tracking. So we see a woman um, moving around the debate and, um, <laughs> and she's really enjoying herself. Um, she, so, so the idea is the fake tracking detects uh, what is, um, where the eyes move. Now, so I, I want to do something similar. So I, the, the, the hearing aid, uh, the HHA, would be something similar like in the glasses, which is on the bottom right hand corner, it's a photo of the glasses, and um, in the top left hand corner is that the camera. And uh, the camera will detect um, what is moving. So because I lip read, and because uh, a lot of hearing people tend to move around the space, so it becomes difficult, so I can't lip read. So the idea of having uh, the face tracking um, were the way that I could create using the HHA. Um, and can we go on to the next slide, please? Can you just start up, uh, we have something here at the top uh, uh, by a company, I think it's a company called YOLO, uh, you only look one. And what we, what we see here is um, lots and lots of things moving around and it detects. Uh, what is moving around. And um, again, it's something that I wanted to do through the HHA, the camera. Um, I hear lots of different things. So, uh, for example, the kettle boiling, I will hear that. So, uh, really, really loud. So, the conversation I'm having will become really, really quiet. I will hear um, the echo, it's it much louder than my voice. So, the HHA will hopefully will kind of pick up those sounds. Uh, so we'll move things, uh, we'll, it will go louder, we'll go quieter, and it will also interact with other sounds. Um, and then down the bottom, um, we have th um, something called the Heart of the King, and um, it is um, a shape of a heart, and it's supposed to imitate the heartbeat of Charles the Third. So my idea was, because um, we, uh, I, I lose one sound, and uh, I rely entirely on feeling. I feel something, I feel moodic. So I, I thought, would it be great to have the idea of holding uh, um, the object and be able to feel it uh, regarding the way you are. But then I thought about accessibility, because accessibility is really important. So the, then using the object you hold, that you have captioned, 
or um, a captain within the object. So it doesn't necessarily have to be on the screen, so it's within the, um, inside the object. I know I'm running out of time. Um, I'm really excited about this project. I'm really excited to be working with Pervade Media Studio. I know nothing about technology, but because of the couple of weeks I've been pervaded, it's given me um, a lot of afterthought about what I could do about making this work. Thank you very much. Our final presentation um, will be from James Hilton, who started with the founder of AKQA, which was one of the most phenomenal agencies for creating immersive, amazing web experiences, real-world stuff, um, and now you're the Chief Creative Officer at Native. I am. Good. And you're going to share some thoughts with us. I am. Hello. <laughs> Say hello back. Hello. Hello. Um, so... so um, I'm James, um, 6'2", 212 pounds, spent entirely too long in gyms, I'm largely sponsored by Nike, um, and I wear a hat. So that's the only differentiator between me and Johnny, otherwise we're exactly the same. <laughs> 45, bald with a beard. Um, Welcome to the tech industry. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> Um, so you know, like at the end of, um, of the end of news bulletins, and you've like you've listened to half an hour or so of like in-depth analysis and really intelligent thought, and then then you have a squirrel on a skateboard at the end, or an idiot. This I'm the squirrel on the skateboard. Um, so I'm I'm feeling like I don't have much to offer, but I'm going to tell you what I'm, I'm going to tell you what I'm all about anyway. Um, so. I dropped out of college, um, as the cliche goes, um, about 22 years ago and started a company called AKQA, um, which was um, at the time called a digital agency. Now, as we've already spoken about, the word digital is, is redundant and pointless. Um, and I spent a lot of time t telling clients that if they asked for a digital strategy, they were already asking the wrong question. Um, so, you know, we, um, there's a similarity there. Um, and I did that for 20 years and grew the company into about, uh, well, there were four of us to start with, four idiots in a basement. Um, and, uh, and that grew to about two and a half thousand people in 14 offices around the world. Um, we sold it like, I don't know, five or six years ago for something like 350 million quid. Um, so that was nice. Um, and then um, about two years ago, um, I thought there needs to be, there must be something else going on in the world other than AKQA. Uh, so I left. Um, so you know that film Point Break where he jumps out of an aeroplane and he just says, I'm about to jump out of a perfectly good aeroplane? Well, that was me. Uh, so that was interesting to do. Um, and I started a, a, a creative um, studio called Atelier Strange uh, that took very old furniture and uh, wo uh, uh, woven, weaved um, technology inside it. So you couldn't see the technology, but it was there. So, you know, things like um, sensors and um, contactless charging and things like that in pieces of furniture that were 17th century. Um, and then I started a custom motorcycle company called Death Machines of London. Um, and that's doing pretty well. And then Native asked me to come and be their chief creative officer. And Native are a product design company, uh, or really rather a user experience company. Um, so we design um, everything from Bang & Olufsen speakers uh, to medical equipment. Uh, we just finished a, an autonomous vehicle for a large American car company, which I can't tell you about. Um, and that's all great. So that's kind of like work history. Um, and during that, one of the interest, I suppose one thing that happened during that work history is um, when you're in charge of kind of that many people, they give you what are called psych tests uh, to find out that you're not totally crazy um, and you can be trusted a bit. Um, and during that time, they found that I, I was going, well, I scored low on empathy. Uh, funny that. Um, and I tend to offend a lot of people because I always told them the truth. Um, and, um, and because I didn't have any empathy, I didn't care what they thought. Um, so it all kind of worked out uh, from my point of view. Anyway, it turned out that I was something called Asperger's. 
Um, and I thought that was interesting for a point. And it made sense of some of the feedback that I've been given over the years. Uh, you know, coal, robot, machine, stuff like that. Uh, and, uh, and then um, you know, it was known that I had Asperger's. Uh, and then I got more feedback. You know, you're not Asperger's, you're just a wanker. Uh, stuff like that, which, uh, you know, is, is all good feedback. Um, and then um, uh, a, um, an editor of a magazine, I was having lunch with her and um, we, we were having this discussion and she thought this was really interesting and so I had to write an article about that. And ever since that day, I've kind of like, keep being invited to things about um, neurodiversity and... Uh, <laughs> And I'm totally the wrong person to be inviting to these things because uh, I'll say something that's really wrong or offensive. Um, but anyway, um, I speak a lot about, um, so I've done like, uh, I'm probably the least educated person in the room because I never actually finished college. Um, but that, that didn't stop people like Ted and um, Oxford University asking me to go and do lectures there and that was always embarrassing. Um, and I would go there and do talks about um, what is creativity and um, what is creativity and technology and what is creativity, how do you become more creative and how can businesses become more creative. And as I'm sat here kind of like, you know, listening to all these introductions, it, it reminds me of those conversations um, because one of the topics of conversation that I go on about is... Um, what is diversity in business? Every business out there at the moment wants to have a diverse workforce. Um, and um, I don't think, I think pretty much diversity is meaningless without equality. Because you can have a whole bunch of different people. Thanks. I probably stole it from somewhere, but. Um, you can have a whole bunch of different mindsets. And when I talk about diversity, I'm not just talking about black, white, male, female. Um, I'm talking about uh, di people from s different socioeconomic groups, different neurologies, um, different orientations, different everything. Different is good. Um, and it's about being different, not defective. Yeah. Um, so when people start talking about disabled, uh, that worries me because I don't really like the word, right? Um, and I know it's a word that is used to describe a certain group of people, um, but I don't see, I see it as a label that has been put upon a group of people to separate them from a majority of non-disabled people. I see disablement as not being able to think and not being able to structure sentences and not being able to communicate in one way or another something effectively for the betterment of mankind. I think if you're not, con the only metric that matters in this world is contribution. If you're not contributing in one way or another, then time to leave. I don't know where you'd go, but <laughs> time to leave. And so how can businesses and technology create environments whereby difference is not seen as defective, whereby everyone's contribution is valid, and whereby everyone is absolutely equal? And there are entire new systems that need to put into place. There is profound change that needs to take place within our societies where difference is concerned. Um, I'll need to refer to my notes because I do tend to ramble on a little bit sometimes. It's all right, I've got you. Have you? Yeah. Right. Um, so yeah, so how the world deals with difference needs profound change. Creative people, and that's everyone, are never disabled. They just need to find ways in which to allow that creativity to flourish in the most appropriate way. So technology can bring wonder, for sure. But technology can also bring wonder why they bothered. Um, and that's just, as, and that's just as, as relevant for 
people with all their limbs and faculties intact as it is for people who don't have leg or don't have hearing or don't have eyes. It's, it's, that's not the factor that differentiates people. The factor is how good can you be at communicating your idea and what medium are you going to use to do that? So really, the difference is that it's to prove that the only barriers that, that anyone faces, the risk, this is how technology can come about, this is how technology can work, is to prove that the only real difference that is, the, diff is, the, is the, are the barriers that people face themselves internally. And how can we change that inside people? So they don't see um, difference as a barrier. How can we take these restrictions that have been placed upon them um, by, his, by history, by society, and how can we make those so that they disappear because labels and societal ideals are just simply control constructs that we can change if we want. But this change has to come from everywhere. It doesn't just come from groups like you guys. This is great, but unless the, you know, the kind of ruling majority is not doing this, isn't acting upon it, isn't making the, isn't making the appropriate changes within their businesses or organizations, then it's never going to happen. It's never going to change. Look at feminism. How long has that taken? It's going to be generational. You know, I talk to my daughters now and I ask them, you know, when do you think equality will happen? And they're actually pretty pessimistic about it. And I say to them, well, no, I don't think it will happen in my lifetime, but it may happen in your lifetime, and it will certainly happen in your kid's lifetime, but everyone just needs to keep pushing. And the same is true for everything. The same is true for access to buildings. It's like, you know, something like the, the, the disability um, law uh, that meant that you had to be able to have access to buildings in wheelchairs only actually came into law in, like, 1986 or something. Like, and a wheelchair was invented in 1700. It's like, why didn't, those two, why didn't those two things come hand in hand? And then I was thinking, what happened before 1700? Anyway, anyway, <laughs> they got me onto something else. So you, right. you probably, you're probably like, coming to the end. Though. I am probably <laughs> coming to the end, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, so with that in mind, that's a really polite way of saying that. No, no. Shut the fuck up. <laughs> Technology can bring about fabulous opportunity for everyone, but it'll only be truly achieved when we're all equal. And that can only happen when our children are taught that difference is meaningless. And when our schools and learning centers manifest true equality, and they stop categorizing our futures based on somebody else's idea of what academic success looks like. When outdated and intolerant thinking is eradicated from our societal systems and our businesses. So, you know, that coder who never fills out his timesheets, He's not a twat, he just doesn't understand time management like other people do. When we're all measured on contribution and no other metric. If we're talking about creativity, that will be cr humankind's creative masterpiece. And every single one of us will be the artist. That's it. Right? Like, what a squirrel. That's, uh, thanks. So maybe let's start with contribution. Like, how do you see technology enabling your creative contribution to the world right now? What are you excited about? Any of you? <laughs> <laughs> you go. Oh, man, I'm the arts admin on the, on the panel. <laughs> no, I, I did, was a practicing artist for a long time. Yeah, um, I, what I can say from what I'm seeing in the field is I think that some of the technologies that are coming into being in the emergent technology area, in terms of how it's enabling artists uh, and storytellers, media makers, is that in some ways it's allowing a layer of reality to get uncovered that in like more broadcast, proscenium arch kind of oriented uh, traditional linear storytelling, um, it doesn't necessarily kind of fit with other ways in which people see reality or experience reality. And so it's, it's, a, it's allowing um, a le a, an experience into a way of experiencing reality that other people 
you know, especially us coming from a Western European kind of uh, cultural lens may have missed out on it. And so I'm, I'm saying this in a couple of ways. Okay, <laughs> let me give it some context. Um, one of the one of the first kind of landmark documentary VR pieces that happened uh, got an Emmy last year called Collisions. This was a piece in collaboration with a, a Martu man um, in Australia named Yari Morgan who had experienced an atomic explosion in his youth uh, from a British test that was happening in the in, in the inter interior of Australia. And when he first saw a VR piece, he saw um, a, a commercial for North Face, you know, thing. It was like a drone going over a mountain climber. And he said, ah, finally, there's a, <laughs> a technology for you white people to understand what it's like to be Martu. Because uh, he comes from the oldest community on the planet, 40,000 years old, 800 generations on that land. And they, when they collectively paint the land, they not only match satellite imagery, but they also match every single geological layer in the painting. They astral project in their meditation. Their whole relationship to the land is one that a traditional screen could never give us a, a, a way into. And so that is just an example of another relationship to reality and to land and to orientation that that this particular technology allowed a, 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 us that didn't come from that a way in. And I think similarly, one of the landmark pieces that happened in VR um, that actually proved, in my opinion, why VR, because that's a big question, because if it, you're just replicating television and film, why put the story in VR? Um, and it was called Notes on Blindness. Has anybody seen this piece, yeah. Notes on Blindness? Okay. So this was a piece that was done in collaboration uh, with a gentleman who had, de had descended into blindness over many years. Descended, right? I put that in quotation marks. Um, me, as a sighted person experiencing this piece, there was a film uh, talking about, because he took these really rigorous audio diaries of, of his descent. He had things like, uh, oh, I, I tried to catalog in my head all the imageries and flowers and so that I could have this visual library that I could call upon when I went completely <laughs> blind. And then he said, uh, and then three years into blindness, I couldn't remember my children or my wife's face. So he said, he, so he talks about some of those cognitive changes. But then in the VR piece, you're in complete blackness. And, and as a sighted person, I'm hearing these old 1980s uh, kind of eight track going of, with all this white noise and just hearing his voice describe all this to me. And then all of a sudden he said, but then I started, and he started talking about echolocation um, and the kind of the ascent of that capability. And then he starts to say, like right now, the pigeon's by my feet. And then they give, they give me as a sighted person just a little glimpse of the, of the light kind of illustration of, of pigeons by my feet. And then I go, oh my God, I was hearing pigeons that whole time or the train that's three miles that way. And then you see a little tiny thing of a, of a train in the distance and I go, oh my God, I did hear a train. Basically through this, I realized how I as a sighted person was completely blind you know, to the auditory uh, kind of reality around me because I depended so much on just my eyes to communicate what reality was to me. And so for me, that's another example of, of how artists are using and hacking into these, these new capabilities to try to illuminate aspects of the human condition and the human experience that we don't get to share with each other. And, and that's, which, that's all I'll say. I think it's very much what, Johnny, yeah. you're trying to do in your work, although we could, we could also kind of delve into the black hole of empathy machines and cultural appropriation and whether it's even okay to pretend that you've given someone an experience of your world with technology. Yeah, I think, um, just to follow up on what you've done, but first I'd, I'd, I'd like to mention, from years and years of watching um, data performance uh, having a, a caption, for me, um, I didn't feel anything. I don't feel anything. I, wa I mean, uh, I watch the theatre performing and I'm watching, uh, um, I'm watching something like I'm watching now. I don't have that feeling. I don't really, I don't get it. And so I stop going to those type of performances um, and I watch normal performances just to physically watch them. But um, with um, what I'm trying to do now is with the HHA, the Hearing Hearing Aid, um, is to really, really um, have a greater understanding of feeling and empathy and so and how we could really um, um, immerse itself into that kind of environment. Um, and that's what I believe in having layered of creativity and um, technology, what I've learned, really add those layered. <coughs> okay, so 
want to pick up? Where you see technology aiding contribution? Yeah, so, um, so like 10 years ago, right, there, was a, there were auditions for an orchestra. Um, and I can't remember what orchestra it was. Uh, but they were, they, were, um, they were auditioning for uh, cellists. And, um, you know, the kind of like the director of the orchestra was, was in the, you know, up in the, up in the, up in the seats. And the, the, the person coming for the audition would come onto the stage and, you know, start playing, right? Um, and at the end, they found that um, about 80% of successful applicants were male. So then what they did is they put a huge barrier, like a cloth barrier, so uh, um, uh, an audio transparent but visually um, opaque barrier uh, between the, the, the people doing the auditions and the, the people choosing. And the, uh, the people walked out, they weren't wearing shoes, so you couldn't tell if it was high heels or trainers or anything like that. Um, and then, hey presto, the end result was 60% were women. Um, who were uh, successfully auditioned. And I think that is a good illustration of what technology can do. Technology levels the playing field. Um, there's no, you can't have equality without a level playing field. And at the moment, it's not a level playing field at all. It all you know, it's always dipping off. To, you need local knowledge. You, know, you need to know that this particular billiard table it sinks down in that corner. Right? And if you don't know that, then you know, you're never going to get a ball down there. So what responsibility, though? So that when we say technology, it means a lot of things. But we yeah. are using technologies of surveillance and control within the culture yeah, sector. Right. We're using GPS. We're using Facebook. We're using technologies which have inherent kind of yeah. um, power structures within them. Yeah. How, do, how do we ask questions or what work do we need to make to address those things? I think it's going to take generations to sort this out, right? This is like, the internet started like 20 years ago properly, right? 20 years ago. Um, we only had flushing toilets like 50 years ago, <laughs> right? It's like, we are primitive, really, really primitive. Um, and and we, we walk around saying that we're a modern culture or we're a modern civilization, we're not. Um, we are at the gramophone stage of this technology and we don't know how to use it. And what we're seeing is we're seeing misuse. We're seeing state misuse of the technology and we're seeing um, great advancements for the, the betterment of society on the other, on the other hand. Um, and I think like any natural system um, that has been born, um, you are going to get um, this battle going on between the two mindsets of how this system is going to be used. Um, and I think, I don't think that's going to be solved in 10, 15, 20 years. I think it will be solved in 100 years. Um, and we will understand then that we can all work with everyone and everyone can have access to th you know, the, the same... Um, abilities that, uh, that everyone takes for granted and everyone can take everything for granted at that point in time. So there's, there's, there's elements of it now. It's like, you know, I get to work with, um, you know, I, I've been recently working with ama this amazing um, After Effects designer. After Effects is like a 3D animation cool shit program. Um, and um, they're in um, New Zealand. And uh, I don't, I've never seen them, I've never met them. Um, I only actually found out um, that they were a guy like a week ago. Um, it turns out, um, you know, he's wheelchair bound. But, you know, I, it doesn't matter. You know, it, it's, it allows him, the, the technology allows him to be amazing wherever he wants to be in the world. Now, I know that's just a really small example, um, but I think it's a shining example for where it can go. Um, I think one of, one of the things that I've found in the conversations I had with people uh, across the technology and media sectors around this particular issue is that one of the ways that we can cut the time down uh, to like kind of 
figuring out how to design, just, design for justice, design for well-being, and design for prosperity at the same time is, is having people in those, in those um, groups that are innovating and deciding the value systems around these technologies from a lot of different backgrounds, a lot of diversity of thought, a lot of diversity of experience, because it helps us to, to find our blind spots that we would like, you know, the classic example is Google's, you know, uh, the, the technology that allows you to like, you know, change the orientation from portrait to landscape on your phone as you're moving uh, the phone around. And for 20% of the population, it wouldn't move. It wouldn't change uh, the orientation. And they realized, oh, that's left-handed people. They just completely didn't have any left, and they didn't have any left-handed people in the small group that was working on that technology. It was, it wasn't malicious. It was just completely out of their, out of, in, out of their, you know, range of their, their what they were seeing and thinking about. They didn't even think or consider left-handed people. So, what I have seen is when you do include more people in those processes, then they find those blind spots much more readily and it helps us to kind of cut that trial and error part. We're gonna hit trial and error, but you know, there's certain people that when they're in the facial recognition technology sector and they start noticing you know, black folks are getting categorized as, as gorillas and that Asian people aren't getting categorized at all, or not getting categorized as having their eyes open, they'll see that a little faster if they're Asian or black, <laughs> potentially. I mean, that's, that's, that's what we're, we're starting to see. So I do think that Absolutely, these technologies can be, you know, a, uh, moral, neutral morally, but unless we do the, we really engineer the inclusion, we're going to experience things like, for example, with the industrial revolution. We're, they're calling us the fourth. Before we get to the oh yeah 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 okay okay. <laughs> I mean, I feel like I could hear Joe intake breath behind me. Um, luckily, we've got a short break, and then we've got the the breakout groups for loads more of this thinking. Um, thank you for this. That was brilliant. I'm like so yeah. There's so much to talk about. Can you join me in thanking James? <laughs> Well, we said it was going to be a challenging day, and hopefully we've, uh, we've delivered on that. Just to let you know where the breakout groups are, are happening, uh, Weston, um, Kamal, and Johnny will be up here. In Claw, uh, Claire will be chairing the discussion. In Foil, uh, Clara Giraud from the Unlimited team will be chairing, and I'm going to be chairing the one in the JLR meeting room. Um, so we've got a 15-minute break before those start. There's tea and coffee in those spaces. Can we all, after those groups, come back to the Western for our final closing uh, <coughs> remarks and thanks and stuff? So that will be at about 4.30. So we've got a bit of a break now and then an opportunity uh, to, to regroup all together at the end of the day. <laughs>